If I had a picture of someone, if I asked you to picture someone who is a genius, whose face comes to mind? There are some really smart people who have lived, who live today, but I wonder how many of you thought of this guy as the wise person or the genius person. Albert Einstein, as people say, had an IQ of about 160. Now to put that into perspective, the average person is around 100. And if you have more than an IQ of 140, you are a genius. And his work bears that out. He came up with that famous theory of relativity. He mastered the field of quantum mechanics, words that I barely understand. In the 1930s, he wrote a letter to President Roosevelt in the United States and warned them that the Nazis might be developing a nuclear bomb. And so he became involved in what is called the Manhattan Project that developed the first nuclear bombs that ended World War II 70 years ago. There's a right reason why we call Albert Einstein a genius for how smart the man was. But would you say that Albert Einstein was wise? A lot of people think wisdom and smarts are the same, but they're, they're really not. Albert Einstein may have been a genius. He may have been way smarter than any of us. But that doesn't make him wise. He may have been able to grasp deep math and quantum mechanics, but he wasn't so good at being a husband or a father. His family life was a train wreck. His first wife, he cheated on her, and then he abandoned his wife and his kids to go after his mistress, who also happened to be his cousin Elsa, and he married her. And then after marrying her, he, I heard about Elsa, yeah, that, not that Elsa, different Elsa. After marrying her, he spent the rest of her life, she died before him, cheating on her. And then writing letters to his children, to his daughters, asking them to help him fix his relationship and save his marriage. Genius, yes. Wise, not so much. When it comes to wisdom, if we want to find out who the wisest person ever was, we just look in the Bible. Because God told us who the wisest person would ever be, to live would be. Namely, King Solomon. And when you think about wisdom and Solomon, you think about the book of Proverbs, which is what we're considering today. But before we look at that, let's look at the promise that God made to Solomon that he would, in fact, be the wisest person ever to live. God said this, I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never be anyone like you, nor will there ever be. God kept that promise. And we get a taste of how wise Solomon was by reading from his book that we call Proverbs and all that he has to say about wisdom. And he had a good reason to write the book of Proverbs. He was training up his son, Rehoboam, to be king after him. And so he wrote all these Proverbs that you can find in the Bible so that Rehoboam would too live in wisdom. So how does, how does King Solomon describe wisdom? Let's look at what he says from our text. And I'll add this thought. We're not just going to look at the verses in our text, but actually add a few later on. Wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has set, sent out her servants, and she calls from the highest point of the city, Let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, Come, eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. So while most of us think about wisdom 
being someone who's really smart, Solomon talks about it very differently. He describes wisdom as a person. Not just a person, but a woman. He describes this woman, wisdom, so that his son might pursue her, might cherish her, might listen to her, might follow what she says, and so himself become wise. But why does Solomon do it this way? Why does he personify or make wisdom into a person, into a woman? Some people think that, well, perhaps it's because the word wisdom in the Hebrew language anyways is a feminine word. But I think it's more than that. And, and some people have suggested that, well, perhaps Solomon wrote about wisdom as a woman because, guess what, guys? We should listen to our wives. And there is some wisdom in that. But it's actually more than that because he wanted his son Rehoboam to pursue wisdom the way that a young man might pursue finding a wife. How he might long to find this person who would be for him the most important, would be beautiful, would, would guide him, would be at his side when the times got difficult. Solomon wanted his son to pursue wisdom the way that he might pursue a loving wife. Because when he finds wisdom, and when he cherishes wisdom, and when he listens to what wisdom say, says and how it might guide his life, it would make him into a great king someday. I think most of the time when we think about what is wisdom, Today we think of it as a, as a character trait or as a virtue. Something that we want to find in our own selves or in others. And when we think about who are wise people, people will throw out names like the Dalai Lama or Mahatma Gandhi. Spiritual leaders. Great thinkers, activists like Gandhi. People who make a difference in the world who are not just smart, but have made a difference. We think of them being wise. But that's not what Solomon does, does he? He personifies wisdom. He makes wisdom into a person. And what does she do that makes her wise? If you remember from the verses we read, he describes wisdom as building this beautiful house and inviting people to her house to enjoy a banquet. Wisdom has, has not, doesn't just have smarts and know-how. She puts those smarts to work by building this amazing house, this fine home, a home that would be filled with righteousness, a home that is filled with what is right and with love and with safety and security and all those good things. And when you read the rest of the book of Proverbs, you find this is exactly what wisdom does. But more than that, wisdom wants to share what she has with others. And so she invites people to her house to enjoy a feast. A feast made with the best meat and drinking the choicest wines that are spiced to enhance their flavor. And to make sure that everybody knows what she has, she sends her servants out to the highest point of the village, it says. That would be like posting it on Facebook or putting an ad in the newspaper, getting the word out so that everyone might come and partake of all that wisdom wants to offer us. Solomon says wisdom is a person. But we know more than that, don't we? Wisdom isn't just an imaginary person. Wisdom is, in fact, Jesus. Our Lord, our Savior, who had all wisdom because He Himself was God. And He personifies wisdom perfectly. Just as He even says about Himself, 
as we read in the Gospels. He said these words about himself. Wisdom is proved right by her deeds. In other words, Jesus embodies wisdom. He is wisdom because like the wisdom that Solomon describes, he too has a plan that he wants to carry out for all people. From all eternity, when people fell into sin, he put into action God's plan to save us by taking on a human body just like us. By revealing to us who God is and by giving himself to be the feast. His body given as the choicest meat. His flesh given on the cross to save us from sin. His blood poured out for us to drink that we might find in him the forgiveness of sins. And just like the wisdom that Solomon describes who sends out his, her servants, Jesus too has sent us out, hasn't he? In order to share from, from not just the top of the hill, but all around the world what he has done and how that is wise. It's hard to see what that means though until we also compare how wisdom is with foolishness, with folly. In fact, Solomon goes on to personify or make folly into a person as well. In the verses that come just after our text, he says this, Folly is an unruly woman. She is simple and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house on a seat of the highest point of the city, calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, stolen water is sweet. Food, literally bread, bread eaten in secret is delicious. But little do they know that the dead are there, that her guests are deep in the realm of the dead. So Solomon too makes folly into a person, into a woman. A lying woman, a deceiving woman who wants to take advantage of you. She makes big promises. Stolen water is sweet. Secret bread is delicious. But you know deep down, as you listen to what Solomon says, it's all a lie. It sounds good. It might sound wise. It might sound very smart. But it leads to death. And what does bread and water compare to fine meat and wine? You see the emptiness of what she offers, and yet it still has this attraction, this taste that might be good. This is, in fact, the promise that worldly wisdom tries to give to us. It, too, presents itself, inviting us in to eat of it, to drink of it, as if it would satisfy us. And so today, people talk about wisdom, and they immediately will go and say, wisdom is about getting the best education from the smartest people. People with lots of letters after their names, like, PhD, or MS, or MD, whatever those letters might be, as if because of their expertise, they have all the answers. It presents chasing after this kind of deep thinking and brain power as it can solve any problem that we might look for. But remember what I said earlier about Einstein? And about his brain power. He was a genius, but he wasn't wise. At least not in his family life, that's for sure. We might think of people like the Dalai Lama as being incredibly wise. And, and millions of people in Southeast Asia especially look to him as their wise leader. 
but his track record with human rights, not so good. Words that he has said has sparked persecution against Christians and against Buddhists who don't follow his teachings in countries like Nepal and Myanmar. What about Gandhi? People look at him and say he is one of the wisest people ever to live. He stood up against the oppression of the British, but he also held up the caste system, a system that discriminates and impoverishes people, and again, especially Christians. Even Solomon, the, the wisest man to ever live, he too stumbled when he allowed his wives, a thousand wives, to lead his heart astray, worshiping their idols, following them instead of listening to the Lord. He fell away. See, worldly wisdom is always going to sound good. And it's going to taste good the way junk food does. But just like junk food tastes good but isn't good for you, in the end, it might even kill you, so worldly wisdom, if that's all we pursue, if that's all we chase, in the end, does not lead to God but leads to death. And that is what Solomon is saying. So what is wisdom? This, this is wisdom. Also not from our text, but right in between the verses we read. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord, finding Jesus, is really finding wisdom. When we find Jesus, we find the Son of God. We find the creator of the world itself who laid the foundations of the world, who made us with all of his divine wisdom. And then in his plan to save us and love us, he came down and became one of us to save us. This was his plan. And by following him, by pursuing him and cherishing him the way that Solomon wanted his son to pursue and chase wisdom, we find it. We find wisdom because wisdom isn't so much about what kind of education you've received. It's not about what your IQ is or how smart you feel. Wisdom is about knowing the Lord and understanding what he has done and how he's reached down to save you and make you a part of, of his family. Solomon wanted to, to give his son, Rehoboam, this kind of wisdom. He wanted Rehoboam to pursue this kind of wisdom, to know the Lord, to fear the Lord, to have faith in him, to trust him, and to make him the basis of all of his understanding. You don't have to be smart to do that. I know Einstein had an IQ of 160, and I've met lots of people in this city who are really smart, smarter than me, and know more about math and science and business than I ever will. But I also know that since they don't know or fear the Lord or believe in Him, my four-year-old son, who trusts and knows that Jesus has forgiven his sins and that in him has eternal life, in a sense, has more wisdom than they do. When we have the Lord, you see, we can truly understand our own human nature. How we are sinners saved by grace. When we believe in Jesus, we understand the purpose of life. How God has called us to a higher purpose and gives us the promise of eternal life. When we pursue the Lord and, and want to cherish Him, we learn about the origins of the world and the challenges that human beings face because of our sinful natures. And yet, 
the grace that God has shown on us that we collectively as a church, as believers in Christ, can make a difference in the world. You see, until you have this understanding, this wisdom that comes from God, you're just pursuing empty thoughts. Thoughts that, that may come to the right conclusion on t- at times, but ultimately, like Solomon describes them, lead to death. No, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. This is wisdom. Jesus is wisdom. And when you pursue Him, and when you cherish Him, and when you chase after Him, God will help you grow in wisdom. He will help you to follow His will. He will help you to take His word and to listen to Jesus every day. He will help you to make good decisions in your life, decisions that reflect God's will and what ultimately is best for you. This is wisdom. Jesus is wisdom. May God bless all of us to pursue this wisdom and to be wise to eternal life in Jesus. Amen.